I was struck by the first lines in both the gospel and the reading to Paul to the Colossians. In both lines we get a, a sense of identity. We know that Luke the evangelist had a background as a doctor. And in that very first line, he's doing a diagnosis, if you will, of Peter's mother-in-law. Scholars tell us that the phrase in the grip of is an old Greek medical term for someone who had a very strong or very high fever. And this is the way that Luke describes it. So he gives us a little bit of a revelation into himself. In Paul, in the, his first line, he makes it very clear who he is and why he's writing to the people of Colossae. See, Paul had never actually been in Colossae, and so he identifies himself as an apostle. He's one sent by God to be an ambassador to the Gentiles, and he adds, by the will of God. He's very conscious that he didn't earn the office or the responsibility. It's something given by God. It's a gift, and it's a calling. But it's also interesting that Paul identifies Timothy as his brother. Timothy is not described as a preacher, the teacher, the theologian, the administrator, but rather his brother. The fundamental quality and characteristic of a member of the church is to be of service to the sisters and brothers. And it's interesting, immediately when the sister-in-law of Peter was cured, she began to serve the others. It emphasizes that quality. But it's also interesting to note that if you put and read the, the letters of Paul in chronological order as he wrote them, you can see a development in Paul's thinking, an evolution in his thought. In the first letters, the first letters to the Thessalonians and then the first and second to the Corinthians, followed by the letter to the Galatians, he always begins by addressing the people in the church of that place. But beginning with Romans and now in Colossians, he, much, he personalizes the greeting. It's to the brothers and the sisters in such and such a place. And you can see that over time, the importance of the interpersonal relationship has become increasingly important for Paul, and he begins to appreciate that. It's not so much just the structure, it's not just so much the organization. It's more and more the emphasis on the person. We're presented that this is the essence of the Christian life. This is the essence of what Jesus taught us about about relationships, relationships to God, relationships to each other. The things that Paul admired about the people in Colossus that he had heard about was their faith in Christ and their love for their sisters and brothers. We see that in Jesus. We always see that people in human need are both primary and the priority. He was always ready to serve. No sooner had he left the synagogue then he heard the insistent cry of human need, and he responded. There was no complaint. He always responded. Early in the morning, Jesus went out to pray, to be alone in that deserted place. And I think it's important that we understand that it's in prayer that Jesus gets his strength, his communion, his sense of communion with the Father. Prayer is indispensable to Jesus and to his communion with God. There are at least a dozen references in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus goes aside, goes to be alone, to be in communion with the Father. Pray too, we must, but prayer must never be an escape from reality. Prayer cannot and should not keep us from the insistent cries and the needs of the brothers and sisters around us. Just as Jesus, we too must respond in whatever way we can Today's gospel is the first mention, in the gospel of Luke at least, of the kingdom of God. It's the essence of Jesus' teaching. And it's the focal point of everything he has to say. And it's interesting when we think, people will ask, what is the kingdom? And I say, well, it's interesting if you look at the gospel of Luke. We find that the kingdom is past because we find in chapter 13 that Luke tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who lived centuries earlier, are part of the kingdom of God. But Jesus then also goes on to say that the kingdom of God is among you. It's present. But above all, it's future. And Paul, in his reading to, in his letter, better still, to Colossians, tells us very clearly, you have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth. The gospel has come to you. And just as the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, 
so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. The kingdom of God, how can we say it's past, it's present? Perhaps it's best to understand, if you look at the, the way the Hebrews write, or the, every line of the Psalms, you find two phrases, side by side. There's a phrase, and the qualifying phrase beside it usually defines the reality. When we pray the Our Father, we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done. The realization of the kingdom of God is the doing, the realization of the will of God. Throughout Scripture, we find these parallel phrases. But when we pray the Our Father, your kingdom come, your kingdom come is realized by doing the will of God. Only Jesus did it perfectly. And Jesus spent hours in prayer trying to discern what God's will was for him, to understand how God was present to him at that moment and how God was present in others. That's the way, too, that we are called, to be in touch with God and God's will, to be open to it. And so I, I'd like to suggest for myself and for all of us that we pray this day to have the grace to be open, open to the will of God in our lives, and have the strength and the courage to embrace it, to, like Jesus, as he said at the end before he died, not your will, not my will, better still, but yours be done. You've often heard me say, and what I really believe, we remember that the will of God will never lead us to where the grace of God cannot sustain us. The will of God will never lead us to where the grace of God cannot sustain us. Please stand. As we gather this day, we remember the many people who join us via television for those intentions, and we pray for all of the intentions that they bring to this celebration. And for them, and for the intentions, we pray to the Lord. We pray for the deceased. We pray for Ethel. We pray for Amy. We pray for all those who have gone before us. We pray that they rest in the peace of Christ and that that peace that awaits us in the kingdom be a source of hope for all of us. For that grace, we pray to the Lord. Lord and we pray that we, each of us can be peacemakers in our own lives. For that grace, we pray to the Lord. Lord and all of this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.